first of all, thanks guys for even doing this and having this conversation. I know that there was a lot of, a little bit of back and forth and we've just been talking about it for a minute now, but you guys all know that my reason for wanting to do this is because I wanted to get into a conversation of a couple different things, but I was having, I was talking with Delone and Riley and we were talking about, you know, their experience being um, in the modeling industry and being black and what they've gone through and kind of opening up this conversation of being black in the workplace and um, their experiences and just kind of let this conversation flow whichever way it's going to and be able to share it with people and um, open up my platform to to talk about these things and, and to share your guys' stories and whatever you want to talk about um, with people who who hopefully when they see it, they they can they can relate and they feel like they can share their stories and they can speak up and talk about, um, their experiences. So, so yeah, that's, that's why I want to do this. That's why I want to talk to you guys. Uh, Beth Ann, we don't really know each other, but, um, I think you're amazing and you're just OG. Um, so thank you. thank you for being on here and thank you for doing this. And Angela, I know that we're recently getting to know each other, but again, I just respect you so much and I love what you do. And, um, I, I would say in our first conversation that we had, you gave me a lot more, you know, like confidence to kind of step into this space and have these conversations. So thank you. And Delone and Riley, you guys are, you know, we go freaking <laughs> way back and I love you guys. And Your peers, so, you guys are my peers. Exactly. And, and the reason that this came up for me too, is because I'm, I'm thinking about like the workspace and, and, me, Riley, and Delone know each other from our workspace and, and our careers, so I felt like it, it made a lot of sense, and we had a really beautiful conversation before we did this, so I just want to get into it and talk about it a little bit. Well, awesome. Um, Haley, thank you for lending your platform to this important conversation, and I know you all didn't want to necessarily speak specific to um, industry things, um, but I know there is an OG on this platform and, um, with Beth Ann, with everything you've done in fashion, um, with activism in fashion, with ensuring that, um, women who look like us have opportunities. I would love for people who don't know your story and know all of the things you've done, um, historically and up till now to ensure there's opportunity. Um, for you to just share a little bit of that, because one, I think that there are things that um, people can learn in other industries to kind of replicate and duplicate what you've done. Um, copycat. But I also think that um, there's so much more that needs to be done. And so hearing from you on what's happened thus far and where you think we need to go next, I think is super important. And we all could learn from that. Yeah, I'm happy. Thank you, too, Kylie. And, and is it Haley or Hailey? Haley. Haley, sorry. Um, and Angela, thank you too for that lovely introduction, both of you. But the fact of it is, is that I, I grew up also, to make it very clear, and I always say to the, in the garment industry, and the garment industry was something where we manufactured clothes and things were made, and it was a different time. You know, eventually, as things become much more glamorous in, our, in, your, in your lifestyle, you, your fashion becomes a, a play. Uh, as life continues to go on, then it becomes luxury brands and all other things. But I came from the 60s, from the civil rights movement to now. It's a, We've had lots of motions in the ocean. We've had a lot of movements. We've had a change of many things. But I've always looked at it as progression. I've never thought in my life that this was it. And I'm never mad at someone if they haven't caught up. I always believe there's still room for improvement. And I never think to myself that they're not going to be able to. So what had happened with the fashion model? I had a model agency, of course, and there's a lot of things I've done along the way. But in that time frame of those 13 years, <clears throat> being successful at it, I was always trying to help people I knew that I was related to in the industry, like designers, to sort of get an idea that they basically could do better at some things when they would ask me, me having a model agency. My model agency was a white model agency, by the way with Blacks and Latins and Asians in it, which was unusual for a lot of people because sometimes Stephen myself would say, you know, you know, I call around and you're the only one that has anybody Asian in the agency. 
So it would always be, now this is just the 80s, okay? And he was always so impressed with everything. But also, uh, luckily for me, I had a good eye. And most of my kids, a lot of them came from Europe. A lot of them were brown, black, white. Some had a little royal touch to them. The point of having the agency that I had was to remain as competitive to my white counterpart. Because in that case, if I was going to have a black model agency, I would have never been heard of. But I also came out of a white environment. You know, I, I grew up in the industry. I helped another model agency become successful. In doing so, I could then speak clearly since everyone sort of knew me and I had no problem. And I, I guess you're born to be a revolutionary. There are things that just come to your call to do. I could actually speak to designers when they got excited to want to have a black girl. And please understand something that's very important for the history. There was a time when there was black models and these black models were part of, which is also white and black models. They were really part of what we then had as, as the um, runway. They took care of all the designers. They took care of all of the industry. It was a different division. Print models did catalog and editorial and, and advertising. The girls who took care of the fashion industry or the, more of the designers or the houses of design were people of the whole other department, department. So basically, a lot of the black girls did runway. Um, in the end of the day, at one point, Calvin Klein wanted to change that. He had a marketing idea that he wanted to put the, the girl that was in the page on the runway so that the editors, when they see the show, they begin to immediately imagine the editorial. He was the one who did that. And when he did that, other people began to follow. But it took a few seasons. To, 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 surely the print girls didn't know how to walk. It didn't matter. He was willing to risk that, and he did it. I was the last model that he used. And at one point, he just, back then, we always had three and four and five outfits. At this point, he had, I just had one outfit. I just wanted to give you that background because it means that we were there. And of course, I did Versailles. And of course, you know, everyone knows now about Versailles, the Battle of Versailles between the French designers and the American designers. And of course, there were like 10 or 12 black girls who helped make that successful as well. But there were many white girls as well with lead of Liza Minnelli and Kay Thompson. Um, as we move on, you know, we used to say runway girls were queens. So the idea is that as time changed, it was very difficult. You didn't see black girls on the runway anymore because they weren't print girls. And that disappearance was something that happened. In my world, in my time, because I know it all and I've been at all, <laughs> When I had a model agency from 1984 to, to 1996, being so successful with it, you know, I could say to Calvin or Donna, Karen, or Calvin Klein, Donna, Karen, um, uh, Perry Ellis, everyone, when they would be so excited to find a, a girl of color, what that would be like. And I used to say to them, well, you know, well, how many girls, because they really regarded me so well. And they loved my eye. Well, how many girls are you going to use? And they would say 35. And now you see, now you see how racist that sounds. <laughs> and they were like, oh, well, God, I didn't, what do you mean? I, I, I thought you'd be happy. Well, I am happy, but we've got to sort of balance it out a bit. You can't ask me for one girl. Or when I used to, you know, I had a one great brunette girl who always worked for brides. And the brides was another one. They never used uh, anybody of color in brides. This is late 80s, early 90s, but definitely. And I would say to them, I said, you know, because when you run, have a white model agency and you're a person of color or you care about integration, you have a lot more leverage because you know what's going on. So I would say to brides, you know, you do know that black people get married, right? Or you do know that you don't even have a bridesmaid. <laughs> and she, the, the editor at the time would get so frazzled. She couldn't believe I said that. And she didn't even know what to say because she didn't even think of it like that. It's a bit of education along the way. Eventually, once the girls start to work a little bit, once we had the fashion model of color in the pages, and she started to work with designers and all, all that was very good. We started the Black Girls Coalition to sort of celebrate all the black girls working and all. Eventually that ended in time and also did the girls of color on the runway. So by 1996, it started to change. Eastern Europe started opening up. 
people started scouting those models from that 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 environment started bringing them in eastern european girls that they, they're i mean their body alignment is perfect for design i mean i worked as assistant designer and that would be that would be our dream body and plus they were hungry they don't know how to be precious they're not american they work very hard and mutual Prada decided at one point that she wanted to have a nondescript amount of models, no supermodels anymore, nobody of color. And she booked all the Eastern European girls that all look alike. They weren't particularly attractive in any way. It was just to look at the clothes. That was the end of the fashion model of color. You know, for a moment, they had a little bit of Alec Wack. They had a little bit of uh, uh, another girl named that skips me for the moment. But basically, there was no one. The, the objective for me was that you could see it for a while. You know, I was being called. I was in Mexico. I had given up my model agency in 1996. And I was being called, you got to come back here. you got to see what's happening. This is terrible what's going on. And eventually, I finally did. And, and then by 2007, we had a press conference. We had to really change it. Because, you know, we had already been there before. It's not like it's never happened before. So because of that, the importance was to help educate the industry back to what they should be doing and not what they were doing. And you just basically let them know that this is inappropriate. Every news media supported it. Every newspaper internationally wrote about it. That was in 2007. Franco Cezani did the, the black issue. Right behind that, I worked with her on that, but that was Franca's whole thing. That was her and Steve and myself. That was a proof that blacks do sell. That was a very easy thing because it, the magazine sold three times. Pre reprints, reprints has never happened in the whole history of Condé Nast ever again. And that too, Franca, God rest her, was her greatest achievement. She, she was concerned. I was hired then to be an uh, editor a large and work with Vogue IT for Vogue Black. I helped develop that on their uh, digital sites. Eventually, it, even though it opened up a bit, it started to slide back again. So by 2000, 2013, we had to write a letter and just name all of the designers around the world who were used to using no models of color or one, two, or three. And when we did that, we let them know whether it was their intention or not, it's racism and that changed everything so that made it all open up again nobody wanted to think of themselves as a racist but this went all to the press and we named a lot of people each council of fashion whether it been british fashion council or uh, champs syndicale in paris or uh, cfda here in america we just named the designers who were faulty and one of my favorite people was phoebe philo and I just adore this girl. And she never, ever. And, you know, we all love Celine under Phoebe Philo. Mm -hmm. And she never, ever used anybody of color. And I know she's a cool British girl. Come on. And I'm telling you the greatest, greatest thing about that. And there were articles all before and all. But the greatest thing is that she changed it so fast. I mean, she put Carly Loss on, you know, as her ad. I mean, she had seven girls. If I wrote the letters... In September 2013, by October, London had changed. Um, in Paris had changed. Italy changed. Everybody just, and it's never stopped. And if it starts to fall back, I have my foot on the clutch. I can't, I'm not an activist. People think I am. I'm really someone who goes, boom. Because the activist is my favorite. Iman always says she loves that statement I make. Activism has to remain active. And I'm an advocate. So I keep my foot on the clutch, girls keep growing. And my greatest achievement, as I would say to Franca, is that I now know models of color who's been working 10 years and still making money, still working. That's, that's you have no idea, young ladies, and all the girls out there, that has never happened in our history. Mm -hmm. So I know we're doing good, but then I had to turn my head to, to designers of color because you know I'm from the garment business, so my passion is about people still saying, where's the black design now? That's nobody black. And it's not true. We all can't be, you know, uh, Virgil, but we have a lot of black designers. My objective is to get their business to be strong. I'm not trying to make anybody famous. I want their business to be so strong that they can last till they can maybe let their children inherit them. 
That's the point. Most designers, most creatives don't know how to be smart in business. They're not, that's not their forte, but that's what we do. So I use the CFDA as a place I can go and take meetings and have them come in once a month. And I have five people who advise them with me. I just pretty much listen, but I moderate it. And they just are so brilliant. It's like about 30 of them. And they're all brown and black. So that's my passion too. And I don't have a, you know, I, like I always say, I'm here to keep educating people. I don't want to accuse anybody. I'm too old for that shit. I try to make them like get smart. And uh, you can always just, you know, this is, <laughs> I always say this journey, this America is a journey. This is not, you know, this ain't going to happen next week all the way. This is a journey. We're here educating. And now this has happened. Now look at this. We're back to saying black and white. You know how proud I am? Because I've never identified as African-American. That's, from, that's somebody else. But that's an intellect, too. I just don't. I'm too gangster. I come from Brooklyn. I'm native New Yorker. Gang fight as a kid. Lady Chaplin's peace out. You know? <laughs> I'm not that. Yes. I'm just, I'm, Beth I'm a, Ann, I have, yeah. a, I have a question for you. There's a couple. You're, not, you're saying you didn't identify as African-American. You identified as black. Um, no, just in case people thought you were saying you identify as white. We just want to clear that up. Yeah. Um, a question for you. Uh, well, I have a couple. One I want to um, I want to give to um, Delone and, and, and Riley and to Haley. But the first thing is you just brought up Virgil, um, who's been mired in a little bit of controversy because of a small donation to the movement right now. But before that, it was um, around his design team not being very diverse, in fact, not being diverse at all. What do you think the obligations are of black designers once they do have these opportunities to ensure that they're hiring teams that are diverse? In his case, he does have, he has diversity in his team, his immediate team. What people saw is that the team in Italy is all white. Mm -hmm. um, Virgil has a, it's Off-White is one company that's his, and they manufacture it. Uh, I think the, the problem that many people don't like hearing a lot of times, they think, oh, this is not right, why, why, why aren't there more and more, is that, you know, to be a design, everybody has a level of what they need from anybody who's looking for a job. You know, sometimes we don't always have the designer who really basically have the skills that maybe a company might need. Even though Virgil has two obligations, one to work for um, a, a, a Parisian luxury brand, he has his own company as well. So, you know, sometimes you don't know to judge them because you don't see it. But I think many people of color look to see who else is around the corner. Not always can you find that particular person because of the training. And a lot of young people of color, they want to do their own things. You know, the millenniums are some, it's a whole different animal. You know, they're not, they're not the Zeds. I'm down with the Zeds. But the Millenniums, they, a lot of them don't want to do a lot of things. They want to be the next guy tomorrow. So they're not going to put in the time to do all of the training it takes to, to start at the bottom and this, especially when you want to be a designer yourself. Mm -hmm. So the truth of it is we all can listen and we all can look for, and they definitely, I think most black designers, I don't like using that, but most designers who are of color basically they do look for the people who look like them too, but you do find people and you want to integrate too. You know, you, you get a lot of good stories and a lot of good things when you have an integration of people, whether it's multiracial. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting thing that this time that people are judged by not having, but right now I think everybody's going to be one of having, but we're not going to hire people because they're black. Cause I surely as a casting director, when I had to do things, I wouldn't hire a girl if she was black just because she was black. If the girl wasn't a great walk, if the girl didn't have the right body alignment, I had to look for someone else. But then don't you think, like to that point, I really do have a question for uh, Riley and DeLone, but don't you think to that point, the only time we start questioning the qualifications of talent is when they're black. Like we, there's this extra caveat where it's like, Oh, I'm not going to do this just because they're black. You have to be qualified. You have to be good. Of course you do. So like, yeah. that's the threshold. But yeah. like that only comes up when we talk about black folks. It drives me nuts. But that might be true. That might be true in the world that you live because you live a broader world and you live more around a corporate world. Yeah. But in the, the uh, uh, I don't really know that to be true because I say that. I personally say 
well, I'm not going to, you know, let's not hire somebody because they're black because I want us to win. Let's hire somebody that we're good enough. We don't have to be brilliant. Let's have a sense of responsibility. I think right now, companies, white, Asian, black, everybody has an obligation to level the playing field a little bit, to try to find who is out there that do have, do have the talent that wants to ride that wave because there is that. I don't know that uh, companies in, in our industry do that, say, well, I can't, I don't want to hire, well, if you're black, because it's not that many black people have the power to hire somebody mm -hmm. <laughs> black. I mean, so I, I can't imagine that that's happening, but it might be. Can I ask you something, Bethann? Do you think that um, just because of the way things have been for so long, just systemically, do you think that people are more automatically prone to hiring a white model over a black model because they think that a white model would just automatically be more qualified? No, they not, don't give a black model the benefit of the doubt? No, not, not when it comes to modeling. No, I think I, I, that's interesting you say that. There was a time, it wasn't because of their qualifications because modeling is it's like being an actor. You know, either you have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. Model can model just like good as anybody else if she has it. Once she has a confidence, once she's grown, what happens when it comes down to runway, there's nobody who can outwalk a, a black girl. Except, except for like Shalom. Yes, she could. <laughs> 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 I can name a few girls that could. But in general, when it comes down to it, they can really do it. I don't think when it comes down to models, they're saying, well, I think the white girl could be better. That becomes something that's in their head that they were used to doing. That's, some, that's what I'm saying. Like, because they were used to doing it, do you think that that, ex that exists where they're just so used to not even thinking about it? So yeah. the, the idea becomes aesthetic. So a long time back in the day, they would say to the model agencies, it's, it's, it's not our aesthetic this season. They used to say that. No, the, well, it's not right. You know, back in the day, if, you know, black models wouldn't even sell very well when it came down to winter and, and fall. It would only happen, they, they would happy to use us when it was time for summer because they identified that it was much more allowing to be more exotic you know you could put again you can put more you know a girl of color should be in something that's more you know look like she could be in you know in a hot place or warm place it's just a, in the mind that changed i mean then you start seeing girls when we changed it you start seeing girls in fur coats it's almost mm -hmm. like they you don't even wear winter clothes. I mean, you know, what do you do? Stay in the house the whole winter, you don't go out? The mentality of how it is, but what has happened in time, they, designers, as individual as they are, they really do follow like a rat pack. Mm -hmm. The next one does what the next one does, and then it becomes a trend. The truth of it be, now you can say, I don't think that a designer now or an editor is looking, not editor so much, but more a designer is looking at a girl and thinking that the white girl could do better. She might, right. he might identify with her more. But now right. it's got so like they're making friends and girls should start to become muses again, you know? That's something that I think Delon could talk to too because we talked about that one night. It, it's a very important thing that designers should start feeling freer because what happened with the, the casting directors and the stylists started to interfere between the, the model and the designer. And that's who started deciding back in the day, the designer and their team is the only one who cast their models. That didn't happen anymore. So it ruined things. So if you've got to make love and be nice to some casting director or some stylist so you can get the next job, and that's what's ruined a lot of our business. Truly. There were times I was so angry about casting directors that I wanted to blow them up with a hand grenade if I invite them all to a party. That's how mad I used to get. Because <laughs> they were really keeping people back, you know? And then I found that it's not just the casting director, it's the stylist also. Then I said, ah. So I know how it goes. Um, can I add to that? Yes. Um, because I don't also, like, I do understand that, like, designers or hairstylists, because it's not just with models, it's also within, like, the, the art team. Like, you know, if the hairstylists are hi hiring, you know, people of color to also be on their team, the makeup artists also hire people of color to be on their team. And I don't think that it's so much as like, oh, a, a white person does it better than a black person, but also you, like, the glam, I don't think there's glam now. You're talking about glam now, right? Yeah, glam. Uh, even even in modeling, but not. I don't. I personally think that 
they are diversifying in the modeling industry a lot, especially when I came in, I started seeing it expanding. But my, my thing is, it should be happening behind the scenes as well. And I really still believe that like what people or what the world believes to be expensive is not a black girl, it's a white girl. And like what you said earlier about, you know, they didn't see it and they didn't understand that like just having an X amount of black girls in a, in a show of like 35 models is racist. It's like, I don't think that they see or understand black women being expensive mm -hmm. if they're not Beyonce or Rihanna. Like, but, you, so, but, but you do see that uh, luxury brands have put, and I say luxury brands because the European brands are really the ones who can do the bigger advertising, opposed to what used to be in America where we used to have a lot of advertising. You see, even between national and international, you see that there are girls of color in advertising, though, right? Yes. No, yes. But a part of me also believes that they're just doing that because they want to get rid of the, you know, the people saying you're racist, like, oh, okay, let me just throw a black model on their cover. Because I also believe like within the teens, like I was just speaking to someone and I told you about this the other day, like how there was a hairstylist who was doing like, a, you know, um, my black friend's hair and she was like why is there no black hairstylist on your team and he's like well you know I find that black hairstylists are really heavy with product and they don't know how to create the aesthetic that I want and and like back to, to tie this in with the casting and like saying like I'm not gonna hire a black model who you know doesn't fit the right walk there's also a level of like well are you searching for that person because they do exist like we're all like black people have proved it numerous times. We do qualify. We are talented. We can do the walk. We can do the hair. We can do the makeup. It's just are you putting in the effort to, to, uh, to to get those people seen? And aren't you aren't you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't you doing something like that? Like creating a group where talented designers um, can all find all the black artists within a, a network, so they know that these artists exist. Yeah, I want to do something with you. You make the, I suggested that to the CFBA that they actually have a roster, have one person that just basically finds out all the talent of people who have skills for the industry abroad. That means not just designers. That just be, somebody could want to want to just be wants to do marketing. Somebody might just want to do good at doing uh, social media. Someone could be just retail. You know, it could be anything. But they should have a roster, not that they prove or bet or decide how talented or right, just have a roster so that the whole broad sense of the fashion industry can then say, oh, okay, I see what you have, and make sure that they're aware of it so that no one can say anymore, well, I don't, because, you know, every industry, every job is so much of a referral. You know, it's not just people just coming in. When I used to get a job, I'd just go to New York Times, um, Unemployment. They don't even do that anymore. Everybody, everything's referral. So nowadays, this is important. If if the designers or the company people can actually go and say, you know, listen, where can I get? And stop thinking that there's not around or I don't know anyone or they don't. A lot of people are just sitting there looking at their white office. <laughs> white office, meaning people that are white. Uh, and so it's important to have something where you really actually have like a uh, I call it, you know, I still use the word Rolodex because it's so cool for me, but it's a, a, a roster of people that exist that this, the whole industry can now look for in that place, have one place, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping that they will do, and I think they'll do. It's my idea to them. We, um, we have a, a little bit of a challenge potentially with the time maybe running out, so we may have to um, yeah. start and stop to rejoin, but... Um, with the time, just in case, Riley, I wanted to ask you, Beth Ann was talking about her model a modeling agency. Um, she said she would have never been successful at that time if it was a black agency. And I want to know, like, especially now, given the fact that things have shifted a lot, not just in fashion, but in a lot of industries, how does it make you feel to, to hear that? Um, and what's your response? Honestly, it's... um. It's disappointing because, um, I mean, I understand what she's saying, but at the same time, it's disappointing because it's just like, it's so many odds against us already as is. So the fact that just because it's 
a black agency, what what takes away from our talent, what takes away from our beauty, what takes away from our personality and the things that we bring to these sets when we come around these people that make you be like, okay, this is a black agency, so we not gonna book these girls anymore. And I trust me, I've heard many people have these conversations that they want to start things like this. And I can't lie, I have the fear deep down in the back of my mind of like, man, like I love the, the passion and fire behind the idea of what they want to do, but what are the odds that they're going against? We know the odds that they're going up against actually, you know? So it's just like, um, it's, it's, it, I don't even know how to, I know. I talking about this, I'm not thinking about it. I just get so in my feelings and like, Obviously, all of us do, but it's just, we've been dealing with this for so long, and we're just trying to eat. We're just literally trying to make a living, and I can see if we don't qualify. We qualify. We respectful. We come. We show up. Wait, it's, it's muted. I can't hear. Y'all oh, yeah. I'm so- I, I, I'm just waiting. I think I fixed it. I was just going to say, I think, I'm, I think I fixed it. You did. Yeah. Did it work? Yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I sorry. Did. That's what I was doing. So please continue. No problem. Thank you. No, I, I, I was just been, I was just pointing out to let you know that after I wanted to say something to what you're saying, um, not, not to misunderstand, there was a black model agency back in the 60s that was called Black Beauty. And, and then and Ophelia DeVore also had a black model agency. I was talking about me. And it doesn't mean they didn't, and they were very successful mm-hmm. because at that time, there was a lot of advertising for blacks because of they, they when they wanted a black person they would go to that agency. My my journey was different. I I'm I'm quite grew up in a white world, mm-hmm. and um, and I had a very natural sense to be with uh, people of color. But I also wanted to know what the other guy was doing, and I wanted to compete against him. And I knew basically I came from an, a, 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 a model agency that was white that we made sure, I made sure that there were certain kids in it that really worked. So when I stepped out, I stepped out consciously. I liked a lot of the black kids. I liked a lot of the boys. I wanted to have boys in my agency. I liked, I just like, I just like people. It wasn't going to be that, but I knew that I was going to be a little bit more top heavy on one thing and maybe less another, but I would never not have what others didn't have. And then eventually they didn't have anybody black when these other little agencies came behind me and then they start to change but they start to steal my kids. When I start making them successful, they would steal them. And as you know, I just have to work all the time. But that's just a, the, the name of the game. You know, I, you, if you've got to get in somebody else's house, you've got to be able to know how to make up the bed and everything. You have to compete. And I have no problem with that. Now things are different. So if somebody wants to start an agency like that and you do something, sure, things can happen. But this is all talking about progress of things. Things change. Every decade or two decades, things change. Nobody was mad before because there wasn't. But I'm telling you, Fia DeVore, Black, and, 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 and um, these other two agencies existed in the 60s and the 70s, 50s and 60s. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up that, that we talked about, Riley, is – because I think this is relevant not just to the modeling industry. I think this is relevant to just in any business, in any career path you want to go in. Um, when you moved to New York and and you wanted to start modeling and they told you that you had to change your name, um, I think I definitely wanted to get into that conversation a little bit because the thing that made me talk to you about that originally was I was reading about something where uh, – there was a certain percentage of, of people that when they submit a resume, um, people who are black, when they submit a resume, they don't even make it to the interview and they don't even get to get to that point because their name alone sounds too black and they get disqual- like they just get disqualified from even getting that interview or getting in the room with the person that is hiring them. And I feel like a lot of people end up changing their name or putting down a different name. And I wanted to get into that conversation a little bit because, you know, I think that that is an issue in itself. And I think that asking someone to change who they are, who the name that they were born with to fit into society to me is whack. And I, I, I'm not cool with that. And I don't like that. So I think that you should share your story a little bit and your journey with that. 
did it all the time. Yeah. I, um, so I actually dealt with both. I, with the normal job interviews, when I first moved to California, I was in California for two years before I came here. I've been in New York for about six years now. And um, when I was in California, I was applying for jobs. And I remember applying, and my name is Ebony. I would apply, and I wouldn't get calls back. So then I would, I decided, I was like, okay, maybe they're not calling me back because they see my name is Ebony. So let me print out my resume and walk into these jobs and give them my resume. And then they see how I, how I am in person and maybe they'll give me the job. Instantly got the jobs. Literally the same jobs I went online and applied for. Went in with my resume, got the job. So when I came to New York, um, my first week, literally not even my first week, the first day that I went in to sign my contract, um, they came and they were like, so um, we were thinking, and as far as your name, we think you should... Um, just drop off the ebony and just go by Riley. And I was like, like, okay, well, they giving me opportunities that I've never imagined. So I just went with it. I was just like, whatever, like, this is going to change my life. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And don't bite the hand that's trying to feed you. Like, just go along with it and accept it. Whatever. Riley is still a part of your name, but I did that, and from there, it didn't get better. It got worse. It was, oh, do you speak like this in front of clients with this accent? And remind you, I'm still covering up my accent when I'm speaking with one of my agents because I'm still not fully comfortable, but I'm, you know, I'm still trying to make sure I'm articulating. I can't speak in my full hood accent with everybody because sometimes people can't understand me. So I'm talking to her in a way, but I'm letting, I'm easing up a little bit because... I'm getting comfortable around her. She traveled to a different country than me. This is my first time being out of the country. And this is the person that's with me. And she's like, oh, do you speak like this? And I'm like, damn, like, I'm not even talking in my real accent. And she talked about this too much. So I'm like, okay, what do you do? So from that moment, I never, remind you, I'm, when I say I'm from the gutta gutta of it, like every possible thing that this systemic racist, whole shit could cause I'm a product of that from and I'm, I'm saying this and I wear it as a badge of honor because it's not just dealt with these things it's so many girls that have and so many boys everybody that from my community have dealt with this stuff and I learned that now as before I, w I wanted sympathy before younger and now as an adult I'm like girl it's bigger than you it's so many people that come from this from a drug addict parent to an absent parent to um, losing people left and right from gun violence, um, in and out of foster care, um, not knowing when you're going to eat again. Um, well, my sister, four years older than me, taking care of me. You know I me, mean? so many things that I look at and it's just like, okay, this is beyond you. It's bigger than you. I don't know how I like drifted off to that. Sorry, y'all. No, but no, but no, it's so good. So good. You know what? I want to say that too, but just, so, just to add to what, Haley said before, and to what you're saying to now, right? Just so you know, Haley, many people change their names. You know, everybody, you know, Jews had to do it all the time. There are some Italians that did it, you know, they had to, in order to, in order to be taken serious or not be decided because of the ethnicity, because they are. Many people did that. But also me, like she, I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm a New York kid. I had an accent. And I used to make myself not have that accent anymore. <laughs> And it wasn't because I was getting into and going to any white. And I just personally didn't want to sound like that anymore. When I began to travel, people didn't know if I was from New York or not. But I just had this pride. But I too, I grew up in the projects. All of those things that you're saying, Riley, you 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 were going, you were on, you were bridging off from where you were talking about and going into some things like education, the yeah. things that you could have. There you go. Yeah. That's a, something that stays in your mind a lot. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, the thing with, I mean, where I was bridging off to that basically just to say that I was being brought into this new world where you would have thought that I would have been the happiest person in the world and so grateful and thankful because I'm traveling the world for the first time. I know when I'm going to eat. My bills are paid. Um, I'm able to help my family. I'm able to sit and be able to make plans of how I'm going to help my community. But I wasn't happy because I wasn't able to be myself. I was from that me being me not being able to be myself or feeling like I couldn't be myself took me into such a place where I feel like it kind of 
I don't want to say it messed up my career, but it definitely took me off of the route that I was going. But at the same time, everything happens for a reason. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here in this conversation, you get me, if, if that didn't happen. So, um, I mean, as far as the education, that's one of the main things. I don't know if, I think we did, we mentioned this. We definitely, that's one of the biggest goals of mine that we need to work on because yeah. Yeah. it wasn't just the accent with me. Yes, I've been in these rooms and these conversations where I didn't feel like my voice mattered because I didn't feel like I was educated enough. I felt inadequate. I would be sitting here listening to all these people and I'm just quiet. And they're like, well, are they, why are you so quiet? And I'm just like, I'm just listening, which I was listening. I was learning. I'm, you know, every day I'm trying to teach myself. I'm trying to learn from the people that I'm around, my, like I surround myself with. But that feeling shouldn't be normal. Like if, if we receive the proper education in these demographics, it just, it just would be so much different. It would be so many girls that don't feel like they need to depend on modeling, singing, acting, um, whatever entertainment industry they, they might go down, it would be so many other opportunities given to them because they would feel like they can do other things. I see so many girls that come to me and be like, oh, I want to model, I want to model. And I don't even be wanting to encourage them to do it, not to say it like that, because it's like, thank God that I've been blessed with this opportunity. But at the same time, it's like, you so much more than that. Like, I know that my vanity is not my blessing. It's, it, it helped me get into the doors to get to where I'm trying to go, but this is not the gift that God gave me. So I see the girls and it be it, it just stressed me out because it'd be like, damn, like if you I don't know, like if you just had somebody to show you and teach you that you can do more, you can have more examples of like a doctor or a lawyer or like even you, Angela, like me seeing you, like that's what like I meant that when I say I see you, I see you. And you make me want to speak up. You make me want to use my voice. I never spoke up. I would bite my tongue and like, I'm sorry, y'all. Well, you, you, like, I, I, I have, I have you, you need, you need to cry for us both because I have to say, um, getting to know you and having you uh, in my life helped me to help you that made me know someone like you because you were very close to how I came up. Truth be told, I wanted to know. I listen to so much stuff and the things that you're saying, this is such a journey. Freedom is, <laughs> don't come easy. This is such a journey for us to all be on really truly. And uh, there's so much more needs to be done. And I know you are beyond the fashion model mentality because you want to see us achieve more. And if we could use all of us who we know to help change the, the bigger picture, it would be so great. And I wondered, I wanted to know, Angela, if I can ask a question too, I wanted to know, when it comes down to your time and you know who you're, you hang out with, does everybody intend to vote in the general election? Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think so. Um, and if I can, I just want to go back, Riley. What do you, what you want me to I want to call you what you want to be called. Would you prefer <laughs> to be called Ebony or Riley? Honestly, I don't mind. Um, Ebony, I love it because it kind of just reminds me of like who I am. It just depends. Like my friends who met me as Riley, I don't mind, but then mm -hmm. it's up to you. If you prefer Riley, you can call me Riley. I'll call you Ebony because you said you love it. And so, um, and I do too. I have a cousin named Ebony. Um, I have friends named Ebony. I think it's a beautiful name. And what I wanted to just say to you for a moment is um, this, uh, this moment, and Beth and I'll tie this into voting, this moment requires of us to think very deeply about what we will choose to accept, what we will choose to allow any longer. And so because things have always been a certain way, people may have changed their names, their skin color, their hair texture to not only survive in fashion, but to survive in corporate America, mm -hmm. right? We don't have to accept that any longer. Right. Perhaps folks said, you know, I'm going to do this so that I can climb an economic ladder and ensure intergener or multi-generational wealth for my families. Whatever the reason was, it was never OK. It was never OK. And I think that the fact of the matter is this is a time for us to really reckon with that fact. It's a reckoning for this country and arguably the world. There's people protesting all over the world right now. 
saying Black Lives Matter. Just a few years ago, Black Lives Matter being said was an argument, not an affirmation, right? And so now we're kind of stepping into this realm where it is an affirmation. And I affirm that to you all, that your Black Lives Matter with all the contours, whether it's a hood accent or not, whether your name is Ebony or not, regardless of your skin color, regardless of how you want to wear your hair, any of, and I would say step into the privilege of the power, Beth Ann mentioned freedom, and that freedom that may not have been fully granted to you yet, but that is up to you to take that first step into. And so I commend you for your voice. Everything you just said resonated with me deeply, either because I've experienced some of that myself, or I have friends who have. I had didn't have to change my name until they find out who what Angela I was named after, Angela Davis. Then it's like, <gasps> who are your parents, right? <laughs> but I would just I would just say to you that whether it's activism, that as I love that, but then activism has to remain active, whether that's your track or it's the advocacy track, you knowing that your voice isn't just about ebony. It's about all of us the same way that Beth Ann, even though I don't agree with everything Beth Ann has said. Um, but I you, know, in your spirit, you do. Yeah, no, what I, what I agree with you on is our end goal is freedom. Our That's end goal is um, deciding for ourselves what we will accept. Our end goal is a reckoning that makes um, America get right with Black people. Um, That's right world get right with black people and how we choose to take those paths it could be very different but what we should all commit to is ensuring that our voices are not just used for us that our opportunities that are presented is not a door that closes behind us it's a door that we hold open for people who look like (laughs) us. we ensure opportunity for so many others and to that end we should vote but we should remain politically active in all of the ways like when you look at a majority of white America, voting is just the first step. That's just the most basic step. They have relationships with elected officials. They know what legislation impacts their lives. And they mobilize and work around those things. That's right. You know, and so I would encourage us to be active holistically. Well, and I do too. So the, the, the key word vote means people all of a sudden become conscious. What you just said is everything true. It's a lot before that consciousness that goes into that whole play. I keep, I've always been, you know, so, you know, I, I, everybody gets so upset that I've been saying since 2000, 2016 that I always already saw eight years being straight on that other prayer. And people say, oh, I know, I agree, I agree, I agree. I, I, I hope it's not from my lips to God's ears. But believe me, I agree. But the point of it really is, is that I'm, I'm so prepared. That's where my machete, picks and shovel comes from. You just got to be ready. The back the fact of is there's a lot of things to be doing to build up and make sure we get the Senate again. There's a lot of work to be doing. And so when you say it's not just a vote, it is to make you think about things, but there's so much more mm-hmm. that goes into that because they're very organized. 